So uh, I'm going to interview Carol Leeming, who is the founder at River Oakfield. Your talk just then was pretty interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Are you sure you aren't talked out yet? I'm good. I'm good. I can You're go good. for a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you've worked a lot between the UK and the US. What do you think the big differences are between the two countries when it comes to security? I think the the UK for quite a while now has been lagging behind. Uh, we haven't really invested enough, as cliche as it sounds, into our kids. Right? We haven't invested enough into education. We haven't really focused on the right things. Um, the US, however, in some states, have really embraced this. Right? They, they've recognized this is the opportunity and they've become leaders in developing the technology uh, that we rely on for security. Right? Because we still need we still need companies to develop these products. Um, but as as a whole, the UK is getting they've, they've recognized now. The government of the day has recognized that ah we need to be thinking more about this. This is a huge opportunity. You know th this is this could be great for 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 the growth of our of our of our country. Uh, but it's very late in the game. Do you feel that as a country we're prepared for the risks we're facing? I think we're better prepared than we were five years ago, for sure. If you had asked me five years ago, I would have said, oh, no, no way, not a chance. But I've, I've been very fortunate that in the last three years of my career, I've been able to go and actually train some of the law enforcement, some of the government officials who are working on these programs, who are, are working to protect us every day. And I've also got to hear from them what their frustrations are, where things need to be improved. And one of the biggest things is that people who work in the public sector within law enforcement, within government, can't speak up. They have no voice. They have to keep themselves quiet or they're banished forever. So my role is to really speak as an outsider, right? Is to, is to basically repeat, not repeat, to emphasize the frustrations of those in, who are working right at the coalface and to try and affect change uh, in places where they wouldn't be able to directly. And I think the government is now listening and companies, more importantly, in the UK are listening more. But we still have quite a long way to go to embed that, that, that security culture and that, uh, the technology embracing culture you know, within society. What we're hearing a lot is that um, the government are under-resourced for investigating cyber crimes. You know, you've got to hit a certain financial limit or whatever it is to actually get anyone to take notice. Is that what you're seeing? Yes, 100%. <laughs> is there anything <laughs> that's a, that's that uh, you think we can be doing about it? What's the solution? Uh, yeah, I mean, not decimating the police budget would be a fantastic start. Uh, you know, we're already seeing the effects of that now. Getting young individuals inspired and interested and trained within these very specific areas of, 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 of specialism would also be a great start. And these things are happening now. You know, there's the, we've already seen things like police budget is now, they're, they're stopping slicing it. We're starting to give them some back now, which is good. Uh, we've seen that some of the three, uh, the, not three, uh, four letter agencies in the UK uh, are going after, uh, you know, the young individuals within the schools at a young age to try and get them into their, their summer camps and that kind of stuff. So that's a good approach as well. But really, when you've got companies offering uh, you know, upwards of 300 grand for some of the best people. GBP is like what, nearly 400k USD. Uh, what chance does government have to hire those people? You know, uh, they train them up and they get them to a certain point, and then they feel the frustrations of the system. And then the corporate comes along and says, "I'm going to give you loads more money and loads more freedom. Come at us, baby!" Right? And and they, and they do, and they leave. So, uh, I think that's a bigger problem overall with how do we modernize politics but that's that's a totally different topic for another day <laughs> so i think you've touched on there we have a massive talent shortage it's very well reported um how do companies go about hiring the best people that's really difficult because to hire the best people you you've got to be to hire a rock star you've almost got to be a rock star 
right? You know, you've got to you've got to be at the top of your game, and you've got to attract them, and you've got to offer them loads and loads and loads, uh, or you've got to find those diamonds in the rough and invest in them, train them, and and nurture them as individuals, and hope that they grow with your company. Uh, with our company, and certainly with a lot of our clients, we use both. So we have the rock stars, but we don't. It's not just a completely rock star driven team, right? They're, they're almost, they're mentors to the rest of the team, right? They're mentors to the younger guys that are coming in or younger guys and girls that are coming in and they share that wisdom. Because the, the rock stars can't, they, they can't, they don't want to deal with a lot of the stuff that comes up on a day to day basis, right? They want to do all the interesting stuff. It's, it's, the, it's the, more, the less experienced ones that have to earn their way up that chain, right? They have to, they have to go for all these different positions to be able to understand all, you know, all the different aspects of cybersecurity. So um, being the best you you can be and being the best company you can be is going to help you attract the best people in every department you can think of, not just in cybersecurity. I think you're so right. So, uh, one of the things my company does is put out salary surveys every year, and we see that people want to work for the best CISOs. They want to have the right buy-in from leadership around security. How do companies demonstrate that their leadership gets it? I think it's 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 actions over words, right? You know, you've got to show your team love. Right? If you're, uh, with, with the days of being a very corporate, you know, uh, first floor to 12th floor me flat mentality, that's long gone. They, they do exist, but these companies are getting hacked left, right, and center because they can't attract the right people, uh, amongst other problems. So, uh, they can, uh, I'm trying to think of, of actual examples. Uh, okay. Take this as an example. Let's say that your team needs budget for something, right? And and they put together a really powerful presentation. They put together a really good, strong case, and they put all their love and effort into it. And the CISO turns around and says, "Oh, well, that's a fantastic presentation. You're absolutely right, but sorry, we don't have budget for it." And it just gets it gets dismissed. A good CISO, or a good CISO, or a good CIO is going to say, "You know what? You guys have put so much love into this." I'm going to fight your corner. I'm now going to go to the board. I'm going to eat a bowl of shit. I'm going to try and make this happen. Right? And he's going to show this is the result of it. This is how far I was able to get. And even if it isn't the end result they were looking for, the very fact that they tried makes a huge difference in terms of morale and a huge difference in terms of how the company is going to perceive you as a leader. Uh, so yeah, that's one of the many things. <laughs> Now, you mentioned a minute ago, guys and girls. Um, we know there's not many women in security. Do you think we're less secure as a result of that? So I'm of the opinion, I speak quite passionately about this, that a workforce needs both female and male brains, right? They, they have, this, this is not a very popular topic, and I was advised not to touch this at, at all costs. But I'm, <laughs> I'm going to anyway, because I, I think it's important. Um, they do think differently. Right? Despite what some people may think, I believe they think differently and many other people believe they think differently. And when you combine these two together, it gives you a holistic view. It gives you a different perspective uh, and it allows you to, to come up with solutions that you may not have necessarily even thought about. You know, I've, I found very stereotypically that, uh, that the, the, the male employees are great for sort of emergency situations. This is more stereotypically speaking. You know, averaged and but the, the the females have been great for the hold on let's think about the long-term implications of what we're about to do here and you've got to consider both right you, you have to uh, I think there is also a cultural problem of females and technology as well being quite um, they're, they're almost put on a pedestal right you know you, you look at some of the the, the more popular uh, female engineers, security advisors and stuff, and you know, when they get singled out and they get put on a pedestal, then they get tons of abuse, tons of attention. It's like, whoa, I'm just trying to do my job. You know, if I had 100 girls messaging me every single day, um, you know, sending me all sorts of pictures, I would probably start to get a bit pissed off as well. Right? So I think culturally there needs to be a change, but 
I have to also admit that we are starting to go in the right direction now, especially with some of the like coding camp camps, coding schools, you know, um, cybersecurity for girls. Uh, I can't remember what's there's there's like a charity there's and a organization. Few of them, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and they're fantastic, you know. And uh, I, yeah, that's that's my opinion. So if you're someone who wants to come into the security industry, what advice do you have for them? So that's a question I do get asked a lot as well because a lot there's a lot of new people coming in, and I think that's fantastic as well, right? We we need different minds coming in to help us solve problems that you know the traditional people have just given up on because they just say, ah, I don't think this is possible. The new minds come in, you know, the the the, the, the fresh thoughts, and, and they just change everything. So I say to people, rather than trying to master all the different things and just being mediocre at best. Find something in that industry that you are passionate about. If you're passionate about phishing simulations, boom, that's, that's your focus. If you're passionate about red teaming, boom, that's your focus, right? And then just be the absolute best at that one thing. Don't ignore anything else, of course, but you know, really excel. So when you're in that interview and you're sat across the table and the person says to you, uh, like one of the questions I ask is, what are you most proud of? Right, in terms of some of your accomplishments. You know, you don't, if you just say to them, oh, well, I did this, 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 and this, and it's all mediocre stuff, that's not going to leave an impression. But if you speak with passion, and you speak with, um, you know, with, with uh, just strength about that one topic, that's going to last in their minds. So, yeah, learn one thing, or focus on one thing, be the best at it, and then pivot on something else. Now, I think there might be some interesting examples to the, this question, but uh, what's the one thing you're most proud of? Uh, Let me up for that one. That's a tough one. Um, I think, you know, it's not, I don't think there's one singular thing. Upward, there is singular things that I am proud of that I've accomplished where I think, you know what, that was so cool. But I think actually what I'm most proud of is probably what my grandparents were, common, were often saying to me that they were most proud of and that I've only started to really recognize in the past two years, which is my, my development and my growth from when I was 18 years old to where I am now. Uh, I see it myself. I see it with my own eyes. I look back at some of my old stuff and some of my pictures and I'm like, ah, oh, damn, that was rough. Um, but now I look at myself and I think, you know what? I'm, I'm spreading more. I'm trying to spread more of a positive message. I'm trying to spread more love. And, and I've had so many people now coming up to me saying, hey, you know what, Cal, you really inspired me. You know, I, I, I think this is amazing. I'm, not, I'm why you got into security. And even if just one person comes up after every event or even just once a year, it's all worth it. The whole thing has been worth it. And so I think sh and being able to share that journey and being on that journey is probably what I'm most proud of. That was a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> Um, now, you've done a few different startups throughout your career. Um, what advice do you have for people that have a great idea and want to set up their own security company? I was once given a fantastic piece of advice. So I think so the person who told me also uh, stole it from someone else, which was uh, if, if anyone asks me, should I start a startup, uh, they tell them don't. Right? And if they listen, then they weren't ready. <laughs> uh, I think in reality, you know, building a company is hard. It's bloody hard work. You've got so much to think about, so much to consider, from sales to business development to hiring to execution, even to the just daily operations, right? And staying focused is a really tough thing. So if you can, if you can team up with people who are fantastic in those areas that can help you, you stand a much better chance. Right? You take the zebra as an example. The reason that was so successful, actually 99% of it is because Adam is just a freaking god. <laughs> I have to admit that, and I'm quite jealous of him in that way. Uh, but the reason is because we worked well as a team. I trusted him implicitly with the business side, and I learned from him. He, re he mentored me, and he, he, he helped me grow into where I am today. And on the flip side, he trusted me on the technicals, and we were both the best at what we did. 
and we pushed so hard to get that out the door. And, but that mutual trust where, you know, if something's going down and we're like, have you got this? I'm like, yeah, I've got it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's like, okay, cool. I'm going to go back to focusing on what I need to focus on. Having that and being able to f keep that focus was, was critical. Um, the same with the other company, Pixel Max, right? That one was everyone... Everyone was great at what they did. You had a designer, you had your engineering, you had your iOS developer, you had all these different things. And a lot of it, though, is, yes, okay, execution, but a lot of it is luck. Right? Success, and I'm going to steal this, sadly, but I believe that success, uh, success, success is born out of luck and determination, just sheer luck and determination. And sometimes you get lucky, and sometimes you don't. Okay. And what do you think CISOs want to buy at the moment? How do they make that decision? Uh, um, purchasing at the moment is very uh, topical in the sense that it depends on what the board is most interested in. Right? It depends on what, what's at the top of their agenda because if, if they've got, I don't know, they've just seen a huge phishing campaign or something or a huge attack or a huge ransomware attack or whatever it may be, and they're like, well, this has now gone to our top five. We need to mitigate this risk. Here's the pot of money. Go. Well, all of a sudden, that then becomes the top of the chain, right? So you, you have to really react to what the market Test that. You have to you have to react to what the market is is demanding and to what people are doing. If you if you could have the best product in the world, the best service in the world, but if the market isn't ready, then you will fail, or most likely to fail. Uh, and um, yeah, just make sure that I mean this is business 101, right? Make sure there's demand for the thing you're building first. Uh, so yeah, you know if you're if you're a company that's selling a particular thing and you're struggling with that, fine, pivot. Right? Go to something else, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to leave that one thing. It means you're going to broaden your horizons and maybe circle back around. But yeah, sadly, CISO purchasing right now, or, or any company purchasing, is uh, very, very much topical. And if you're in a CISO position, you've got stuff you want to buy. How do you convince your board, your company, to allocate you budget for the right stuff? Ah, this is a great one. So th this is one of the areas I excel at and have, have done for the last two or three years now. Um, it's a game. It is all a freaking game. Uh, you've got to, you've got to look, you've got to look at what does the board want, right? What's their agenda? You know, what can you do to help them? If you can make their lives easier, if you can help them to help you, as, as cliche as that may sound, you will suddenly find things become a lot easier. Right? So if you, let's say you need to buy product A, right? and product A is X amount, and you go to the board and you say, just a single sheet of paper, and that single sheet of paper says, we need to buy product A because of this risk here. And you just hand them the sheet over an email or something, and then you go into the meeting, you're like, oh, did you check that email? And they're like, well, yeah. You really think we're going to sign a check just on an email? So no, you, you have to sell it. And this is, where, this is what differentiates good CSOs from rock star CSOs, right? or CISOs. Um, you, they've got to really engage the board and be able to sell to them. Right? It's a bit like raising capital in a way. You've, you've got you to wine and dine them, right? Maybe not literally, but uh, you, you've got to really show them the love and make it as easy as possible for them to hand you a check. Right? If you don't do that, then you've only got yourself to blame if they don't give you that money, right? And, uh, and, if you do, and if you make the absolute best case possible and the board still says no, you can either suck it up and move on or you can go and find another company. So, yeah. If there really isn't budget or it's, you know, it, it's coming up to that time of year where people are doing their budgets for next year, if there's nothing left, how do they get some quick, cheap wins? Ooh, um, okay, so if you've got an IT team, uh, an IT engineering team, then you can, there's, there's tons of open source products out there you can use, right? Yeah, there's tons of things like, um, I don't know, how, many, how many people here are technical? Okay, so you, you've got various like, 
Okay, I'm just going to touch on just one aspect here. Let's let's take log analysis as an example, right? When someone logs into one, of, someone does something on the machine, whether it's they they hack into it or they 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 steal someone's password or they install malware, whatever it may be, right? It will leave a paper trail. It will leave a log event or several log events. And the idea is that you collect all of these log events, all of these this audit trail, and then you look for uh, what's called IOCs, indicators of compromise, right? And this this is just basically telling you something weird happened here. It's an outlier. To something about it, right? And companies charge hundreds and hundreds of thousands for this. Or you can go and install a bunch of open source products like uh, Kibana as one example, Logstash, there's a whole bunch of them. You can use a lot of AWS's stuff as well, you know, that's sort of, okay, you have to pay for it. And by the way, I'm not endorsed by AWS in any way. Uh, although, again, I bloody well should be. And um, yeah, you can use these and, and boom, you've just got your log analysis stuff, right? Uh, you, you have to understand it. You have to have someone technical that will go through it and set it all up. Uh, it, you can use Chromebooks as well. That's another great one. Uh, you can get rid of all your on-premise stuff and use uh, you know, a, hosted, uh, a hosted exchange provider or you know, my, uh, Microsoft Office 365, something like that. You know, you could, there's so many different quick wins. Um, the best thing to do, though, is if you are not capable of managing your security, be it through an outsourced means or in or in house, then at the very least you use a hosted service that does that thing for you, right? That builds that some of that security in there. And then just spend a weekend learning, right? Udemy, YouTube, any of these places, just go and look for a cybersecurity course, one that's like hands on. And if you, you know, if you've got a whole engineering team and you haven't got a security team, fine, get the engineering team to do it. Right? Okay, they're not going to be a replacement for security team, but they're a, a good step in the right direction. So yeah. There's some of the quick wins. And if you're, um, well, I guess any size organization, how do you know if your security is good enough or, or just good? Or how do you know you, how you compare to your competitors? So this is where uh, risk assessments will come in. right? So it's either going to be a business risk assessment or it'll be a cyber risk assessment. And effectively, someone just comes in and they look at all of your, um, all of your auditory Sorry, your regulatory comply uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, they look at all of your. They, they help you with your uh, your threat model. They help you with you know basically determining what are your business risks from this thing called cybersecurity. Uh, and then from that, you you then have a report that says we need to do this, we need to do that. You know these these are areas of risk, and then and then you focus on them. Uh, you the other options you can do penetration testing. Right, you can do vulnerability testing or what we call red teaming, which is where someone goes and tries to, they have a very specific goal. That goal may be, we want to go and steal the CEO's inbox. Okay, that's their goal. The red team are going to go after that, whereas a penetration test is more about see what you can do, you know, see, see what you can find. And um, you, know, you can use those approaches, uh, but they are expensive. You know, uh, e even with the race to the bottom that we have right now with the security vendors, you're still for, for a typical red team assessment, for a decent red team, you know, you're talking like 10 grand, 15 grand, and that's with one of the starter companies, right? That's with one of the companies that really wants to, you know, to, to just get that client base out there and prove themselves. With some of the bigger guys, you know, you're paying sometimes upwards of like five, 10 grand a day, right? So um, I, I would say, look, decide what your budget is and, just spend it wisely. You know, don't put it all in one thing. And if it's small, then just try and get as much stuff for free. <laughs> so we've seen some significant acquisitions in security this year. And you've just said, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that want to do it and uh, want to grow. What do you think will happen within the vendor space over the next 12 years? Uh, 12 months, not years. So the cyber, the cyber security market right now is very fractured. Indeed, um, and that's why we're seeing so much M and A activity, right? Mer um, mergers and acquisitions activity. Uh, it's going to continue, that's for sure. And we have a real problem at the moment, where, as a decision maker, if you want to go and make sure your environment is secure, some of the things you've got to think about: you've got to think about log ingestion, log analysis, endpoint security, endpoint response, instant response, case management. Uh, Security culture, uh, phishing simulations, what else? God, uh, the uh, file integrity monitoring. You've got, you know, you've got, you've just got 
like 100. I actually have in my slide somewhere, I have this, uh, it's like a map of all the different areas of cybersecurity. And then you've got this huge section of like governance and, and compliance, or governance, risk, and compliance, GRC. You got all these different things. And what the industry is begging for, every, almost every single CISO I've spoken to are begging for, is a company that can just do all of this, but do it well. Right? Whereas what you have right now is you have a company that has a really great product in a specific area and then they use the success of that product to, or service to pivot into other areas and then they, the people think, oh, they're a great brand and you know, they're, they're established and they did excellent things in this area. They must be great in that one. No. And that's why you have so many people say, oh, but I had a fantastic experience with that company. It's because you've, you typically you've had different services from them, different solutions. Um, I, I don't know when things are going to get better. I do know that right now it's like a, a never-ending fire hose that we just have to deal with, uh, you know, in, ter in terms of risk and in terms of problems. But at the same time, it's keeping a lot of people in their jobs. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and uh, a lot more that are needed as well. So, do you think that that uh, M&A activity, the acquisitions, do you think they're good for the industry? There's a lot of talk when companies do get acquired, maybe it's not going to be great for their development or for definitely for pricing. Yeah, I've, some of my most favorite companies have sadly been decimated because of this. Uh, this is a really hard one, right? Because you, on the one hand, you want there to be uh, a one, not a one size fits all solution, but something that you don't want to have to have the hassle of managing 10, 15, 20 different vendors to, to, iso to, to mitigate one business risk. You just want to deal with one vendor. On the other hand, you are then locked in with that vendor and you rely on them. I don't know. I, d I don't know what the answer to that is yet. But I would say on the business side that, yeah, it's of course it is a good thing because it means a lot of people are making a lot of money. So, and it means making more jobs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think there's going to be, there has to be a shift at some point. There has to be a fundamental change in how we approach cybersecurity culturally and technically for the situation to improve. Do you think we're going to see more attacks on vendor companies themselves? So like the Kaspersky attack a little while ago, for instance. Uh, I can't you know. go near that. Okay, fine. <laughs> but can we, uh, do you think we're going to see more of that happening? Uh, yeah, um, a lot of this, it's already been happening for years, right? Yeah, but the difference now is before it was all getting swept under the carpet. Now everyone's dirty laundry is being aired out there, right? There's no one is immune to this, as we've seen from all these breaches. So I think it's more about the public perception and awareness has increased, but the actual amount of attacks, okay, they've changed, the types of attacks have changed, but you. I want to pivot slightly on this answer. If you'd have a look at some of the documentaries about hacking and some of the news programs about hacking and some of the, uh, like even like Fox News programs about hacking way back in the you know, 80s and 90s and stuff and you look at how they were talking about it and you'll see we're repeating the same thing right now that we were 20, 30 years ago. It's, we're, and we're forgetting, we're forgetting the, 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 the lessons that history has taught us. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've watched a lot of those. You just unplug it, right? You just unplug it, that stops the attack, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. No. Yeah, un unplug the power cable, don't do that. For <laughs> Christ's sake, don't do that. For anyone that's wondering why, it's because you lose all the friend, uh, you lose forensics capabilities if you pull the power. Uh, yeah, there, there's, there's so many. But it, it's, good to, it's good to watch them and see the similarities, especially of the fear mongering from then to now. And it actually makes you look at some of the vendors now and think, oh, they're laughable, it's crazy. Do you think any of those uh, risks, those fears, you know, uh, massive terrorist cyber attacks, something that really takes out a city or an infrastructure, do you think we're going to see that happen? Yeah, sadly. Um, I have spoken on critical national infrastructure before. I've done a couple of events on this topic, and 
it's it's not my area of expertise, and I'm not I'm not a subject matter expert in that industry. But what I can say is, you look at all the attacks on ICS, the industrial control systems, and SCADA, and you look at how horribly insecure a lot of this stuff is, uh, and and how backwards these companies are, both the designers and and the companies who who use them in terms of you know not thinking about the security culture, and it's inevitable that something bad's going to happen, and I. You know, I just really, really hope that that it doesn't end up being something horrible like you know nuclear fallout or something like that. You know, where we actually see a loss of life um, because there are breaches, there are security instances that have happened that have caused people to be killed. Right? You know, you look at instances where intelligence has been leaked out about undercover undercover operatives and stuff, and and they've been straight up assassinated as a result. You know, it's like that's crazy. That is actually crazy that a piece of data can result in the end of human life or at the end of a, of a human life. So uh, yes is my short answer and I, I just really hope that we start to mitigate those risks before they, you know, before they happen. Now we're almost at the end of the year, so what do you think cybersecurity, data protection, what do you think the next 12 months are going to bring us? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> Fishing simulation is definitely a big one that has kind of, again, I'm biased here, right? Because it's one of the things we do. But that's definitely something that people are picking up more on now. It's no longer about telling people to, uh, to think about phishing emails. They're now testing the employees on this. So that, that's, that's a very topical one at the moment. Uh, Penetration testing has sadly gone way down the bottom in terms of pricing. It's bottom of the barrel now, but as a result, it's more affordable. People think they're getting value from it, and in some cases, they are getting value, so they're doing it. So, yeah, that's another area. Uh, of course, GDPR is a big one at the moment, um, as, as you can see. <laughs> uh, and regulation in general. You know, people, companies are realizing that that consumers are waking up to the fact that this is their data, that they are entitled to know what's happening with it, and that they're becoming a little bit more conscious. And, and they have to think about the brand impact of that as well. You know, previously, I think five years ago, what companies would have actually had a brand advisor uh, on standby for the event of a data breach? No, they would have had their legal team, right? Coordinate their, their lawyer coordinating everything. You can imagine the chaos that would ensue, right? No, instead, you, you think about, okay, when a breach happens, you need all these different teams around you. You know, you need your insurance guys, you need your legal people, you need your PR team, you need your instant responders, you, ne you need your board, you, you need your advisors, all these people. And, um, and there's various solutions now coming up to, to help facilitate that kind of communication, right? To make it easier for companies to respond in the event uh, of, of these attacks happening. Uh, so I think that's one of the areas. Uh, and finally, I would say on endpoint detection and threat hunting. Uh, threat hunting is a really big one that most people aren't really doing properly, but we're starting to see some technology and some companies coming up now that they've actually got some pretty cool stuff that works out of the box, right, as opposed to marketing hype. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of exciting things happening. Okay, well, thank you very much. You've been speaking a long time. So uh, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Thank you very much.